wonderful to be together in God's house this morning, and I love that song, and I hope that that song represents the prayer of your heart. I know it does mine, uh, but I have to be honest and say, though, my desire is that uh, through my words, through my actions, through my attitudes, uh, that I would always exalt the Lord. Sometimes um, I, I fall painfully short, and... Um, if that's where you are today, I just want to encourage you to realize that when we take a step of faith and decide I'm going to be a Christ follower, um, you know, I treat it a lot like teaching our kids to walk. When they fell down, uh, we picked them up and brushed them off and kissed the alley and said, let's try that again. Don't give up. And uh, I hope that my life will one day be consistently, every day, all the time, exalting to my Heavenly Father in every word that I speak, every deed that I do, every thought that passes through my mind, in my attitude and actions, and through every facet of, of living. I pray that's uh, your desire as well. I'm so glad that you're here today. We're beginning a brand new series called Multiply, and um, you know this is a great time to jump on board and be a part of what God's doing here. Um, multiply. We teach a lot in series around here because we feel like it helps us to kind of have some traction and build upon precepts week after week. And every week usually stands alone, but there's still some things from the past uh, that can be helpful to us. But you're in on the ground floor of week number one of Multiply. And um, I suspect that every person in this room at some point or another has said, uh, said the phrase, something doesn't add up. Something does not add up here. Have you ever said that? I've said that. And usually when we say that, um, it's kind of a suspicion kind of statement. It sounds like something bad to say something doesn't add up. Well, I want to pose a different thought for you to consider this morning, and that is that sometimes it's a good thing if things don't add up. And I want you to think about that. When God enters the equation, things won't add up, and that's a good thing. Sometimes when you uh, find God entering the equation, you'll end up with more than you expected, and that's a good thing. In this series, we're going to go uh, learn what can happen in our lives when things begin to multiply. Um, multiplication is one of the basic mathematical operations. Add, subtract, multiply, and divide. You remember that? I, I, my first recollection of it, I'm sure I had learned some of it earlier, but I especially remember second grade math. And uh, I remember third grade, the multiplication tables and how all that went together. And, and um, I loved it when it was simple. You know, add, subtract, multiply, and divide. When we got into some of the geometry and calculus and algebra, I started not enjoying it nearly as much. But add, subtract, multiply, and divide. I, I get that, and we all understand. Well, <clears throat> for in, if, if you would think about your finances, that's the easiest place to factor in multiplication. Let's talk for a minute about that. Uh, when it comes to our finances, uh, how many of you like addition? You like to add to the finances. I mean, we get our paycheck at the end of a week or at the end of a couple of weeks, and you get a little addition, and that's a, a nice thing. That's a positive thing. Or uh, another way to find some addition in our finances, we sell something. Uh, maybe you like to get on eBay or Craigslist, or uh, maybe you put a sign out in the yard and sold a car or uh, took out an ad in the newspaper, and you sold something, and so there was a little bit more addition. Um, maybe you made a solid investment somewhere along the way, and so you experience more addition. Uh, whenever there's some income going up, that's a lot of times as a result of addition. A less desirable thing is subtraction. None of us like subtraction. Um, this is the second of the month. Probably some of us are still feeling the pain of the subtraction of the mortgage payment or the rent payment. You know, maybe that was just this past weekend and you did a little subtraction. Um, maybe it's uh, you were like me and you did a car repair and you had some subtraction. And then you took it back and had it again and more subtraction. Maybe that's where you're living. Um, maybe, uh, maybe you bought some groceries this week. For some of us, that's a little bit of subtraction, and for others of us, it's a lot of subtraction. It's a lot more subtraction when I do the grocery shopping than when my wife does the grocery shopping. There's not nearly as much subtraction, but there's not nearly as many groceries either. So I think it's uh, the right thing to subtract a lot when it comes to food, especially for Super Bowl Sunday night. Um, some of you have experienced division. Um, that might have been the result of a divorce or a breakup of a business partnership. Um, 
maybe that's how you've uh, found division to take place in your finances. I think it's safe to say, though, that all of us would love it if we could see some more multiplication. You don't see that often, but it'd be great if we could. And this morning, we're going to take a look at a passage uh, where there are some interesting principles at work. And if we can understand these principles and put them into practice, I believe God could bless and multiply our time, our talent, and our treasure. Um, the passage that we're going to study today, it's not a parable. This is a real story, a real life event. It is the only miracle of Jesus that is documented in all four Gospels. That's why I think it's important for us to set up and take notice that if this miracle was so important that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all wrote it down, we need to hear what is being said and we need to understand what God is trying to say to us through this important story. The characters in the story are real people. Jesus is speaking to the crowd that most theologians believe was the largest crowd that he ever spoke to. And um, I want you to see how this story unfolds. Luke chapter 9 is where we're going to be reading. Uh, I'll be reading from the New International Version. You can turn in your Bibles or go on your electronic device. And uh, we're going to read three or four verses now. And we're going to keep our Bibles open and come back uh, to some several other passages that will help us kind of understand how this narrative uh, unfolds for us. And Luke gives us a great account of this historic event. Beginning in verse 12, he says, Late in the afternoon, the twelve came to Jesus and said, Send the crowd away so that they can go to the surrounding villages and countryside and find food and lodging because we're in a remote place here. He replied, You give them something to eat. That's Jesus speaking. Then the disciples answered, We've only got five loaves of bread and two fish unless we go buy food for all this crowd. About 5,000 men were there, but he said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. Now, um, the crowd may have been 10 to 15,000 people or larger. Whenever you see there are 5,000 men, there are women and children around, and those numbers didn't usually factor in, and, and so we have to calculate for that. And so easily 10 to 15,000 people have gathered, counting women and children, and at Jesus' direction, the disciples had the people sit down in groups of 50. Picking up at verse 15, the disciples did so, and everybody sat down. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke them. Then he gave them to the disciples to set before the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. 12 basketfuls of leftover. I, um, I've always wondered about the leftovers. Why were there so many leftovers? And not only that, but what did they do with the leftovers? I hate to waste things. I want to know what happened to the leftovers. Inquiring minds want to know. And um, I think it's okay to kind of speculate. It's kind of fun to do that sometimes and wonder about the story and imagine a little bit. And I've kind of done a little bit of that with this story, thinking about what happened to those 12 baskets, because the Bible doesn't say. Uh, we don't read anything about it. I, I, I used to think the boy probably should have gotten the leftovers. There was a little guy that gave his lunch. And we didn't read that in this passage, but... As I said, this story is in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't say anything about where they came up with the five loaves and two fish. But if you go to the Gospel of John, you'll read that uh, Andrew brought a little boy along that had the five loaves and two fish. He brought his lunch, and, and um, apparently that's how he, he got that food with him. And I think he's my kind of kid. I mean, I don't like to leave the house unless I know what's for lunch. I want to know where am I going to eat and what am I going to eat. And uh, my wife says, some people, you know, eat to live, but you seem to, you know, live to eat. And uh, there's a difference, and I've been trying to figure out what that's all about, but... Uh, Anyway, this kid, he brought his lunch, and um, he decided he wasn't going to get stranded without food to eat out in this remote place. But um, that would create all kinds of problems if he got those leftovers, because there would be a question of how would a kid get 12 basketfuls of leftovers home, and then when he got home, what's he going to tell his mother? I mean, if you walked in the door with 12 basketfuls of leftovers, what would your mom say? The first words out of her mouth are going to be, where did you get this stuff, Right? Um, I've told you in years past about my little hardware store heist when I was five years old. 
um, we went down to the little hardware store in Bowersville, Ohio, and, um, you know, I'm five, six at the most, and uh, they had the bins, you know, down the s side of the wall, and, and uh, man, when you're only this tall, and everything's right there, and it's easily exposed, and it's nice and silver and shiny. It's not in packages. You can reach in and get a handful. And I remember reaching in and feeling, you know, the, the nuts and the bolts and the washers and dropping them in the, in the bin. And I just decided, you know what, maybe I should have some of these at home to play with. And I poked some in my pockets, and then at home I made the mistake of getting them out and playing with them. And my mother's first question was, where did you get those? Just like the kid, if he would have taken that food home, where did you get that stuff? In my case, I had to go back and talk to the manager about what I had done. I don't know who he would have had to explain it to, but moms want to know. Where did you come up with this? And I, uh, I, think, uh, I think it could have been the boy that got the leftovers, but just in the last week or two as I was preparing for this message, I, I am beginning to think down a new path. I, I think that it is possible that the uh, disciples could have wound up with the leftovers. 12 baskets, 12 guys, makes sense to me. Disciple doggy bags is what I think they invented there that day. One basket of leftovers for each of the 12 disciples. And, um, you know, here again, I don't know, was it the little basket on a table or was it a bushel basket? I, in my mind, I just think of a bushel basket. And I think it would have been good for Jesus to have said, hey, guys, this will teach you. Everybody pick up a basket, carry it back to town. You know, you're in the heat of the day carrying this basket full of food back to the city. They'll never forget. They'll have more faith maybe the next time. Who knows? But um, I do think there's something about putting yourself in the story and kind of trying to use your imagination and think about what must they have been thinking, what must they have been experiencing, what was going on in their hearts and minds as, uh, as these real life events unfold. So if you imagine yourself there that day and see this story playing out, um, imagine yourself telling Jesus, hey, we need to get out of here. I mean, it's late. Uh, we've been here a long time, Jesus. It's been a long day. The people are getting tired. Everybody's hungry. And that's, you know, we all realize that sounds very caring and considerate and compassionate. But really, it's about saying, I'm really tired. I'm really hungry. I've been here a long time. But hey, it's these guys. Let's do something and get them something to eat. Well, then this kid wanders by and he's got this picnic basket or a to-go bag from Long John Silver's and that's apparently all the food they could round up in this big crowd. And so the disciples have to be thinking, surely Jesus is going to let us out of here now. I mean, no resources, virtually no resources whatsoever. Surely we ought to be able to get out of here. But Jesus took a look at five loaves and two fish and he looked at that and said, that's just enough. Not what the disciples were thinking at all. And uh, so he said, have them sit down in groups of 50. Now imagine that. I mean, if I said to you all, hey, let's all break up in groups of 50. Can you imagine the chaos and pandemonium that would break out in this room? I mean, it'd be just kind of crazy for a little bit. And uh, no doubt it would have been a nightmare there in that setting, um, you know, because there's always somebody, always somebody. Hey, what do we got to do that for? Well, you know, hey, are you going to feed us? What do we do? You know. Yeah, it'd just be a lot of stress and tension trying to get everybody broken up into these groups of 50. And uh, there's going to certainly be somebody wanting to know, why are you doing this? Are you going to give me something to eat? I, you know, I'll do it if we're going to get something to eat. I'm starving. I'm tired. It's hot, you know, whatever. And so you hear all this kind of commotion going on. And I could even imagine certain people in the crowd. I mean, no doubt there are people there that know the disciples and uh, probably somebody that knew Peter or James or John. Hey, 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 you know, getting their attention hook me up with some of them rolls right there. You know, you know, they're thinking that they might as well get their foot in the door. There's going to be some rolls. And I know I said them rolls. I did it on purpose because that's the way they talked back then. They said, give me some of them rolls. And they're trying to entice, uh, you know, give me a little preferential treatment. Help, you got to help a brother out. That's what they're asking for. And uh, there's some in between the lines reading there. I understand that. But the disciples, they had everybody sit down in groups of 50. And then they probably thought they knew what was about to happen. Um, you're there, you're envisioning that we're going to take these loaves and fish and feed this crowd. Nobody has any idea how, but they've got to be assuming Jesus is going to perform some kind of uh, amazing miracle. And so the, the moment that he gets ready to bless this meal, I believe they had to be peeking. I mean, wouldn't you be watching that food to see what happened? Is Jesus going to pull something out? Is he going to pour something on it? Is it just going to kind of expand? What's going to happen here? How's it going to go down? 
And uh, we don't know exactly what it looked like, but the Bible does say that Jesus looked up to heaven and that he blessed the food, and, he, the, the, and then he broke it and he gave it to them. He gave it to the disciples to set before the people. Um, there's no evidence that anybody looked up and all of a sudden these, these five loaves and two fish turned into this mass quantity of food and there's a buffet before them and there's truckloads of food. There's no evidence of that anywhere. I think that what happened was the disciples took a piece of bread and a, you know, some of the fish and they went out to one person after another passing it out. And I could just envision them handing it to the first guy saying, hey, there's a lot of people here. We don't have much, so don't take a lot. You know, be, be sensitive, be thoughtful. And they're kind of going down the line. But I think they get down to the end of the line and they look at what they've got left in their hand. And they just fed a whole row of people. And they about got the same amount they had when they started with. And so maybe they went down and did that again with the second line, or maybe the second group of 50, and on and on it goes. And, and perhaps the miracle didn't happen in the master's hands at all. Maybe, just maybe the miracle happened in the hands of the disciples. See, there's lots of things about this miracle that we don't know. And we could speculate on them all day, and you could ask me, and I could ask you, and we could tell stories, and we could make a lot of that up. Uh, somebody asked me, you know, after the first service, well, where'd they come up with the baskets? I don't know, but we could, we could dream up ideas about all that. But here's the thing. For all the stuff that we don't know, there are some things we do know. And that's what I want to focus on with you this morning. Here's what we do know. The miracle of multiplication, it teaches us three important things. First of all, you have to start with something in order to multiply. You have to start with something in order to multiply. It doesn't have to be much, but you have to have something. Because one times zero equals zero, right? And a hundred times zero equals zero. And a thousand times zero equals zero. Any number times zero equals zero. The good news is God can use the little we give him no matter how little it is. And what may be tiny in our hands can be blessed and used in God's hands. I'll give you an example, excuse me, of how multiplication works. And uh, it's an amazing and profound example, if you ask me. This, this, let's just say I'm going to ask somebody to come to work for me for 30 days. I'm going to give you a penny a day for 30 days. But every day, I'm going to double what I paid you the day before. Would anybody want to take me up on that? A kind of a deal two or three hands you know where this is headed first few days I start out day one I'm gonna give you the penny just like I promised and you're gonna look at it and you're gonna think what's that all hey hey that's what we promised go home day two I'm gonna give you two cents it's gonna snowball up to the fifth day we're gonna be all the way up to 16 cents after one one whole week but as you go into the next week we'll get up to 32 64 we'll be all the way up to five dollars and twelve cents at the end of working for, for 10 days basically then the next five days rolls around and we'll move from ten dollars to twenty dollars to forty dollars to eighty dollars to over hundred and sixty dollars by that uh, third week by that uh, 15th day it'd be actually two weeks so we're gonna go seven days a week on this gig now, now look on the next 20 days the next five days leading us up to 20 you see there on day 16 you, you would get paid three hundred and twenty seven dollars and we're just multiplying just doubling it times two 655 times 2, 1310. By the time you get up to day 20, you're making $5,242 a day. That feels pretty good, doesn't it? Not bad. Oh, let's look at the next five days. Uh, you, you will jump in five days from 10,000 to 20 to 40 to 80 to over $167,000 on that 25th day. It's starting to feel really good. You're loving working for me. I can tell by the look on your face. On day 26, 335,000, all the way up to on that 30th day, you will receive $5,368,709.12. Who wants to sign up for that program? Everybody wants in on that. That's the miracle of multiplication. You see it snowball so quickly. That's $10.7 million cumulatively over just 30 days by starting with a penny and doubling it 30 times. It, it, it just gets out of hand in such a hurry and uh, you have to have something though to start with. But the point of this example is to say, it doesn't have to be much, just a penny to start out with and double it 
30 times and look where it goes. Just think how that principle could apply in your life. If you would just bring God whatever you have, knowing that he can multiply it, even if it's only a penny's worth of your time, a penny's worth of your talent, or a penny's worth of your treasure. Just bring the little bit that you have and give it to Jesus and watch him multiply it. It takes a little something to get this thing started. That's principle number one. The second principle that we can know for sure, for something to be multiplied, it has to be blessed. For something to be multiplied, it has to be blessed. What do you think would have happened if the disciples had just taken the fish and loaves and started handing them out to the crowd without Jesus blessing them? I mean, if they'd have just walked out and started handing out fish sandwiches, it would have taken about two seconds and everything would have been done and it would have never multiplied. See, the bread and fish were multiplied because of God's blessing. Jesus blessed the food first, and then he fed the multitudes. He blessed the food, then fed the multitudes. We get it backwards. You know, we try to do our thing, and then we ask God to bless us after the fact, and we need to make sure that we begin with the blessing. Just another way of putting God first and keeping things in perspective and, and in the proper order. Because no matter what it is and no matter how small it is, with God's blessing, the little you have can be multiplied and used. With God's blessing, the little bit you have can be multiplied and used. Some of us have sung a song maybe when you were young and you remember little is much when God is in it. And it's the truth. Little is much when God is in it. Jesus adds value to everything we give to him. He blesses and adds value to everything that we give to him. For instance, he was given a coin and he made it into a lesson of responsibility to God and to the government. He uh, was given a boat and he turned it into a pulpit on which he could stand and preach and teach to the multitudes. He was given a donkey and made it an image of servant leadership. He was given a bowl and a towel that became an example of humility. He was given an old splintered rugged cross and it became the symbol of our salvation. See, no matter what it is, and no matter how small it is, Jesus can bless, Jesus can multiply the things that we bring to him. And with the blessing of Jesus, anything can multiply, but without the blessing of Jesus, these folks that day are going home hungry. So, here's the third lesson. It must be given away in order to multiply. If you want to experience the miracle of multiplication, even if it's small, as we've already said, you have to start with something. Can't be zero. Even if it's small, though, start, start somewhere. Start with something. Number two, the blessing is essential to multiplication, but there's no multiplication until it's given away. See, if you give something to Jesus and he's blessed it, you don't consume it on yourself because it will never multiply until we give it away. Jesus said over in John 12, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. See, if you go to the <clears throat> garden store, I, I used to plant a lot of garden when I was a kid, and I, I loved the garden. I even, uh, my, my boys still make fun of me. I used to sell burpee flower seeds. Anybody ever heard of burpee flower seeds? Sold flower seeds door to door, and they make fun of me about that. Um... You know what about the flower seeds? You could leave them in the package and next year you'd still have just a handful of seeds. And you could leave them in the package, they'd never grow. That'll, that'll never work. They, they didn't do anything until you put them in the place where they could multiply. And we'll be talking about that more in a couple of weeks, but uh, the, the point is what is blessed cannot do anything until it's given away. Isn't that the lesson Jesus taught in the parable of the talents? I mean, isn't that what it was all about? You have to invest it. You have to give it away. You have to do something with it. I want to give you an example. My friend Carly is going to come up and help me here. And um, Carly, uh, I, I told you later, a little earlier, I told you um, how much I got for an allowance when I was your age. Do you remember? $1, Parents were cheapskates, weren't they? My mother's here. It, it, it was, it's the economy. Things have changed a lot. Back then, a dollar was a lot. And um, the tithe, or 10%, was 10 cents. And so I want to give you that 
dime there because that represents the tithe. That's, the Bible says that the tithe belongs to the Lord. And so every week I'd get my dollar, I would give my parents 10 cents so they could put it in the offering. Now I want you to hold that dime out here. Is it still in there? You didn't put it in your pocket. Let me see. Okay, squeeze really tight. Nobody gets that dime out of there no matter what. She's got a death grip. I mean, her knuckles are turning white and everything. God comes along, and I'm holding on to what's his, and he wants to bless me, but I'm not really in a place to receive his blessing, am I? Because I'm holding on to what, you know, to what he's given me. Now, she's being nice and not opening up and grabbing like the Venus flytrap, but she, here goes all this money. She could have been getting that, but she's, she's locked in. But the thing we don't often realize is... <clears throat> God's supply of dimes is unlimited. There's no limit to the supply. And so he comes along and he keeps trying to give you blessings and keeps giving you blessings. And there's no, no getting that dime out of there. But look at all the dimes that you're missing because you're missing out on the blessings. What are you going to have to do to get those dimes, Carly? You're going to have to open it up. And what are you going to do with it? Give it to him. How do you do that? Dump it. Go for it. And then when your hands are free, look what can happen. You're already doing better. And then, oh, she gave it again. And then he fills it. He fills it. And then she's given it. And then he fills it. And then she gives it. And then he fills it. And then he gives it some more. You might as well start using two hands, it looks to me like. So she's going to use two hands. And when those two hands get full, she dumps it. And then he fills it. And then she gives it. And then he fills it. And this goes on and on and on. She gives it and he fills it. She gives it and he fills it. Look at us go, Carly. And then she just keeps giving and giving and giving and giving and giving and giving and giving. And it's full and she fills it. And then she gives it. And then he fills it and she gives it. And look at that. Over and over and over again, the Bible says in one place, test me and see if I'll not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing, you will not have room enough for it. And this is an, a classic example of that passage of scripture. Didn't Carly do a good job of teaching us about giving? Thank you, Carly. You can have a seat. <clears throat> well, I'll tell you, I want you to write this down. It's not in your notes, but I, I hope you will remember this. When I give, I get to open my hands to a God who will not be outgiven. When I give, I get to open my hand to a God who will not be outgiven. Luke 6, 38 says, give and it'll be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. It'll be poured into your lap. What do you think would have happened if the disciples took the bread and the fish that Jesus had blessed? And they just ate it. I mean, what, you ever think about what would have happened if they'd have just eaten it and never given any of it away? It would have never multiplied. They had to give it away. And I believe that both the blessing and the giving are two elements that have to be present in order for us to experience the miracle of multiplication. See, what, what you learn as you study these disciples and as you study this story, they had a scarcity mentality. There's no question about that. This is before they finally got it. It's before Peter's declaration that Jesus is the Christ, of the, the Son of the living God. You see, they still had a lot of doubts and confusion. They had a lot of a scarcity mentality, and they thought there was not enough. There's not enough food. There's not enough money. There's not enough faith. But they brought the little bit they had, and God multiplied it. He multiplied what little they had, and all of a sudden there was more than enough. See, whenever God enters into the equation, I would tell you the potential truly is limitless. In fact, I'd love you to jot this uh, little equation down in your notes, if you would, please. My contribution multiplied by God equals infinite possibilities. In the area of time, talent, treasure, you name it, my contribution multiplied by God equals unlimited, infinite possibilities. Remember the boy that came with the five loaves and two fish? He brought what little he had. Jesus blessed it, and he gave it away. We refer to that as a miracle. And here we are talking about that boy and that event and that miracle 2,000 years after the fact. I'm guessing that by the end of the day, that boy consumed more than his fair share of five loaves and two fish, don't you? Any of you have a teenage boy at home? You know, if he took five loaves and two fish to the meal, 
and they had 12 baskets of leftovers when the day was done. I'm thinking he probably had around 20 loaves and 10 or 12 fish at least. That's what he would have done because that's the way growing boys are. But, you know, he brought what little he had. God used it, and, and maybe he did get to take home a few of the leftovers. Maybe, maybe he brought home more than he even took to start with that day. We don't know all the details, but what we do know is that God performed an amazing miracle that was preceded by some specific events. How might God want to use the miracle of multiplication in your life this year? How could these principles apply in your home, in your life, in your finances, with your time, with your talent, with your treasure? I'd ask you to think about it. What's in your hand? What's in your hand today? Is it a, is it a thin dime? 10%? Is it a penny? A little bit of influence, a little bit of time, talent, treasure. What do you have that you can bring to Jesus in the way of these things? And do you realize that little is much when God is in it? I was thinking this week about how many times we have a tendency to pray to God about our finances. And I suspect if we were to take a poll today that Everybody in this room would have to admit that at some point along the way, you've prayed about your finances. Maybe feeling like there wasn't enough. If you took time to pray about your money, do you think that that shows that you believe God cares about your money? I think that it does. The Bible talks a lot about money. It's safe to conclude that God's interested in our money, and that is because our money reveals a lot about where we are in the area of priorities. It reveals a lot about who we are. It says a lot about what's first in our lives. On a day like this, in an illustration like this, maybe God would speak to you about finances, maybe about your tithe, maybe about how you can invest your, your talent and your, your influence in certain areas of your life. Today he's spoken, and the question is, will you trust him? Does God keep his promises? Can we expect that we can bring the tithe into the storehouse and trust that he'll bless it? Can he give us a good measure, pressed down, shaken together? Is that the way the Lord wants to work in your life? See, bring God whatever you have, knowing that he can multiply it, even if it's only a penny's worth of time, talent, and treasure. Jot that down in your notes before we go. Bring God whatever you have, knowing that he can multiply it, even if it's only a penny's worth of time, talent, or treasure. Even if it's a thin dime out of every dollar, he can multiply it, but first we have to give it. And then he'll bless it, the miracle of multiplication. Bring what you have, even if it's a little. Ask God to bless it. Give it away. Just see what God can do. I hope you'll join us for the next couple of weeks. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, a great story, the, the sowing and the reaping next week, and some principles we can learn from there. But uh, before we go, I'd love to have you stand with me, please, as we pray together and um, ask the Lord to apply the truths that we've heard today. <clears throat> let's pray together Lord over and over again we see how when we give to you you multiply what we give you bless us you bless our obedience you bless our faith we don't want to live with a scarcity mentality like the disciples we give we give in a, a small amount sometimes but we give in obedience and you bless it and you multiply it we give, you bless it, and you multiply it. I won't pretend to stand here this morning and say that I understand completely how it works, but I've seen it happen again and again and again in the lives of your people. So today, we pray that you would help us to trust you more. Give us the courage to obey even when our obedience goes against conventional wisdom. And God, as you give us more, and many of us have been given more than we would have ever imagined. Help us to understand it's not all about increasing our standard of living. But sometimes you call us to increase our standard of giving. I pray that you would help us to have the courage to obey you. To give sacrificially. To give generously. To give extravagantly in every area of our lives. Time, talent, and treasure. Help us to say yes to you in all things. 
We trust you today. We recognize you as our source. And God, I, I thank you in advance for all the ways that you have and that you will prove yourself faithful in the lives of your people. We pray these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful day. Look forward to seeing you back next Sunday for week number two of Multiply. Have a good day.